Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in. Welcome to Kesar Kitchen, where you travel to India and the Near East on a plate. My name is Chef Naina Bedwar. I'm a self-taught chef and um, my aim is to bring the flavors of uh, India and the Near East out of the pages of cookbooks and restaurant menus and into your home kitchen and to make them accessible and doable for everyone. If you wish to contact me, I can be reached at the uh, email address for my business, which is Kesar Kitchen, that's K-E-S-A-R Kitchen, all one word, at gmail.com. And I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Kesar Kitchen. So the recipe that we're going to be making today is a fish recipe, a fried fish recipe called tareli machi. Uh, tareli means fried and machi means fish in the Gujarati language of the Parsis of India. The Parsis are a group of Indians who came to India many centuries ago through uh, Persia. So um, this is a uh, Indian recipe using Indian ingredients that you would be able to find at your Indian grocery store uh, or at um, in Atlanta at the DeKalb Farmers Market. Uh, the fish that I'm using for this recipe is boneless and skinless tilapia fillets, which you can get uh, at any supermarket these days. Uh, you can also use any other firm white fish, such as catfish or pollock. Uh, try and avoid using uh, fish like cod, which flake very easily. Uh, you want something that's a little bit more firm but not too meaty, so don't go towards halibut or those sorts because they're a little bit too chewy. You want something that's firm but that has a, a flake. So um, the first stage of this recipe involves the marination of the fish. So that's what I'm going to show you just now. And then we're going to uh, create the marinade in this bowl, pour it onto the fish, rub it in, and then set it aside. How long you set it aside for is anywhere between 20 minutes to overnight. So this can be an uh, easy recipe to do on a weeknight. You can do the uh, marinade the night before and then uh, pop it in the fridge and fry it the following day when you come home from work. So it's uh, ready relatively quickly. Uh, so the ingredients that are going to go into the marinade are these. Uh, almost all Indian recipes you will find feature ginger and garlic in some form, uh, usually in the form of a paste or very, very finely minced or grated. So if you don't uh, use ready-made pastes, such as those that are now available in supermarkets, you get those uh, tubes of paste in the... In the um, uh, produce section, you can use those or you can buy fresh ginger and garlic and grate them on a microplane or use a, uh, a garlic press to mince the garlic very finely or if you want to do it in larger quantities which is what a lot of Indian people do in their kitchens is you put the garlic into a small blender and you blend it up and make a paste that you can then keep in your fridge that is accessible at any time. So what we have is a tablespoon of garlic paste or very finely minced garlic, a tablespoon of ginger paste or very finely minced ginger, uh, some turmeric turmeric powder. Uh, you could also use fresh turmeric in this recipe, but tra traditionally the powder is what is used. If you use fresh turmeric, which is easily available these days, you would have to multiply the amount by three. So the recipe calls for half a teaspoon, so you would need to use a teaspoon and a half of fresh grated turmeric in this if you wanted to. Uh, we also use red chili powder, a teaspoon of that, however that is optional. That gives uh, a little bit of red color and it also adds some heat to the recipe. If you want to use a milder chili powder, you certainly can, but this is a typical Indian red chili powder made from Kashmiri chilies. Um, then we have some lime juice, the juice of half a lime. We've got some salt and we've got some garam masala. Garam masala is a typical Indian spice mix, kind of like an equivalent to Chinese five spice, although there are in certain regions of the country way more than five spices uh, in here. A typical northern Indian garam masala could have up to 11 different whole spices that are ground down into a fine powder. Uh, it's also quite easy if you have the right um, gadgets to make your own garam masala at home. 
uh, it's made of very aromatic spices. So what we do is we put all of those ingredients together into the bowl. We've got the ginger, the garlic, and the lime juice. And we mix that up just to, so that the spices have a moist base in which to mix. We put in the turmeric, the red chili powder, the salt and the garam masala. Now since the salt is in the marinade you won't need to separately season the fish because the marinade will do the job for you. Now depending on how much um, moisture is in your ginger and garlic your marinade may come out dry or it may come out uh, wetter than this. Uh, you do want it to be a little bit wetter than this so that it can spread easily over the fish. So because this is quite dry, I'm going to add just a little splash of oil. This is grapeseed oil, but you can use any um, you can use any neutral flavored oil for this. So as you can see, that's made it into a sort of a thick dropping consistency which is perfect for spreading all over the fish. So once that is mixed together you just put it on top of the fish and mix it up. This is something that you can also make way in advance. You can make a marinade like this up to a week in advance. You can double the recipe and use it on chicken or um, other, um, other meats as well. So you just put that onto the fish. Bread. as long as you're okay with your hands turning slightly yellow from the turmeric. Just mix that through and make sure that it's coating each fillet generously. It smells great, unfortunately we don't have smell-o-vision. If it's clumping in parts, just pick it up with your hands and just spread it in. So these, these tilapia fillets have been uh, cut in half down the length to make them easier to handle. You can of course keep them whole or you can also cut them into four pieces each so that you get larger chunks. To uh, help remove the turmeric stain from your hands, you need to wash them as soon as you possibly can and if you find that it's staining your nails dip your nails in lime juice and leave it on there for a little while and then wash it off and that will help to bleach your nails back to their normal color. So that's our marinated fish that we will just set aside now until it's time to cook. Okay so we're back now making the second stage of the fish recipe, the tari limachi. Uh, so we are going to fry the fish which has been marinating. So we've had it marinating for about an hour but you can uh, of course marinate it for longer if you like. But 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes should be the minimum. The oil that we're going to use to shallow fry the fish is grapeseed oil in this case but you can use any um, high smoke point neutral flavored oil. So canola, uh, vegetable, anything like that will do. Try and avoid olive if you can. Um, partly for the smoke point and partly because it has such a strong flavor of its own that it competes with the flavor of the spices and can change the flavor profile. So you want the oil generously coating the bottom of your pan. And what we're going to do is we're going to fry the fish and uh, then after the fish has been taken out of the pan, the spices that are left behind will lend themselves to a sauce that we're going to make with some surprising staple pantry ingredients. So, oops. Just gonna use a spatula, get the oil heating up and shimmering. 
This does have a tendency to splatter a little bit, so you want to keep the heat at medium low. Stand back a little bit. You should be able to get four or five fillets done at a time in a pan of this size. So tilapia doesn't take very long to cook, two to three minutes aside. Keep adjusting the heat if you feel that it's become too low, but definitely don't let it get too high because the ginger and garlic starts to pop and can um, get you right in the face. So you definitely want a pleasant sizzle. And you want to let it be in there until it caramelizes slightly on the bottom side before you flip it over. It's been a couple of minutes, maybe three minutes or so, until we've had the, we've had the tilapia frying. So we're going to very gently use a spatula to flip them over. Just get a little bit of gentle browning. And then cook it on the other side. Uh, people have asked me if you can do this recipe in the oven as well. Uh, if you just add a little bit more oil to the, uh, to the marinade, you can uh, put it onto a cookie sheet and cook them in the, uh, in the oven, about 350 for 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, you wouldn't need to flip them. Just put it in and take it out when it's uh, opaque. However, the frying does lend a certain uh, flavor to the, to, the, to the spices that you can't quite get when you bake. So the fish has all been fried. So there were four uh, tilapia fillets all together. Each one had been halved lengthwise. So they have all been fried and arranged on this platter. So um, you can serve it just as is. Uh, you don't necessarily have to make the sauce. This is a, a delicious dish on its own. Uh, works beautifully eaten with the dal, the recipe that has also been given in this um, series, uh, along with steamed rice. Uh, or another really wonderful use for these is for Indian style fish tacos. You can uh, use each fillet in a tortilla or in an Indian chapati bread wrap which you can get from the Indian stores and add in some uh, green leaves, some pickled onions, some shredded carrots, um, maybe a little bit of mango chutney for some sweetness and just wrap it up and it makes a delicious snack, a uh, meal or even like a lunchbox treat. So that's our fish and now we're going to make it in the typical Parsi style which is to make a sauce that goes along with it. So what we've done is um, taken the fish out of the pan, uh, removed all the um, excess crispy bits that are lingering in the pan, taken out almost all of the oil save a couple of tablespoons and uh, What's left in here is the leftover marinade uh, in, the, in the bowl that the fish was marinated in. So you want to heat the pan back up again, keep it on medium high, make sure any of those crispy bits are out because you don't want them burning on you and turning your sauce bitter. Spread the oil out. Uh, and then you go in with your leftover marinade and you want to scrape that bowl clean. So that was the ginger, the garlic, chili powder, turmeric and garam masala along with some oil and lemon juice. And to that we're going to add a quarter cup of ketchup. Yes, ketchup gets used in Indian food. <laughs> Some sriracha chili sauce or any other kind of chili sauce or hot sauce that you like. This is two teaspoons, but of course you can use more if you want it to be hotter or leave it out entirely. If you don't want any and just increase the amount of ketchup, we've got two teaspoons of Worcestershire sauce, a teaspoon of soy sauce, for that umami 
flavor, some salt to taste and a teaspoon of sugar. All that gets mixed around. Make sure it's nicely blended and then we add in half a cup of water which I quite often will put into the marinade bowl so that you really get every last bit out. Pull that in. And you want to let that come up to a fairly vigorous boil before adding in a cornstarch slurry which has been made with two teaspoons of cornstarch and an eighth of a cup of water that's been mixed together which is the best and only way to incorporate cornstarch into your dishes and help to thicken the gravy that is then going to be poured over the fish. So this fish can be eaten by itself, it can be eaten in the typical Parsi style as it was when I was growing up with just crusty bread and butter, uh, as well as with rice and dal as a complete meal. Or as I mentioned, in a wrap. So that's coming up to the boil. The cornstarch has a habit of settling, so you want to make sure that that's thoroughly mixed together before it goes into your sauce. So once you've got a vigorous boil going, you just pour all of that in and start to stir. You only need to give it a few seconds to thicken. Make sure that the cornstarch cooks, which doesn't take long at all. These silicone spatulas are a great thing to use on these sorts of dishes. Switch that off and then you see whether it's the right consistency if you'd like it thinner. At this point you can add just a tiny bit more water. I prefer it thicker because it really coats the fish. You don't have to use all of it. For serving I'll usually put three or four spoons on top and then serve the rest on the side in a gravy boat or in a bowl and people can serve themselves to more of it if they'd like. And then garnish with some chopped cilantro and that's your tarali machi ready to serve. Okay, hi everyone. So the recipe we're going to be looking at today is uh, a humble sautéed potato, but it uses a range of really interesting spices, so it takes it to a new level. Uh, the uh, ingredients that are used for this recipe are primarily South Indian in terms of their flavor. So uh, we use coconut oil and um, there are a couple of stages to the recipe. The first stage is the sauteing of the potatoes in a pan with coconut oil and a few spices and then later on we work with a tempering which is what gives it its unique flavor. So uh, some of the spices that we use today are unusual enough that you would have to go looking for them at an uh, Indian grocery store or you can also, if you don't have one in your area, you can also find um, Indian groceries online. Uh, Patel Brothers, that's spelled P-A-T-E-L, uh, the website is patelbrothersusa.com, they um, deliver the most unusual and uh, wonderful and exotic of Indian spices right to your door. So uh, to start we will heat up our pan. It is uh, advisable 
if possible to use a good quality non-stick pan for this recipe uh, something like this however if you don't have uh, something like that then you can uh, also use stainless steel uh, you are likely to get a little bit more sticking on the bottom you would need to be careful about how high you turn the heat up if that happens you can deglaze the pan with just a tiny little bit of water to make sure that the spices don't also stick and burn in the pan so the first thing we do is we heat up our coconut oil. Coconut oil has been getting a little bit of a bad rap in the press lately uh, in terms of using it internally. However, um, the South Indians have been cooking with coconut oil for thousands of years. Um, so I would say everything in moderation. Make sure that you don't use it in excess. But certainly the amount that you use for this recipe, which serves six people, is um, more than okay. So we uh, the coconut oil is solid at this temperature but it melts just as soon as it hits the pan so we let that melt one thing about these potatoes is that they have been par cooked so they are about 75 percent of the way done and your the sauteing just takes them to 100 percent you wouldn't want to saute them from raw uh, not only because it would take a tremendously long time but um, they would also they also possibly scorch in your pan so you want to either boil them or microwave them or steam them but get them to uh, 75 percent of the way done so the coconut oil is heated up you're going to go in with the potatoes. You're going to make sure that your pan is big enough to accommodate everything, all the potatoes. Just get them lightly coated in the oil. This is four cups of potatoes. Uh, in here I've used uh, the small baby Dutch potatoes. You can use any kind, but it is advisable to use a waxy potato, so something like Yukon Gold or these Baby Dutch, something with a thin golden skin. Uh, if you are using russet or uh, that, that sort of potato, then you would definitely want to peel it. You can also use red uh, and you can leave the skin on. As you can see, these Baby Dutch ones have got the skin on. If I use the larger Yukon Gold, then I usually peel them. So you're just getting them nicely coated in the oil and then we're going in with the first lot of spices um, three of which are familiar just salt black pepper and red chili flakes and ground turmeric which is uh, also becoming a very mainstream spice these days the turmeric helps to stain the uh, potatoes a wonderful golden color which also makes them really appealing to look at the chili flakes are optional, just depends on amount, the amount of heat that you want in the dish. So we sprinkle over the salt, the ground black pepper. The pepper also lends a fair bit of heat, so if you want to leave out the chili flakes, that's fine. And the turmeric. Make sure that the turmeric is spread evenly so that you don't get clumping. And you don't get one part more golden than another and then you want to just stir that nicely make sure that those spices get evenly distributed you can see the golden color spreading through really looks so pretty quite honestly even just these four spices give this so much flavor you could even leave it here and not go to the second stage. Even this is pretty tasty. This could also be a way to dress up leftover roast potatoes that you might have left over from a roast dinner. Pop them in the pan and add these spices to them. Okay, so now that they're nicely coated with all the spices, what you want to do is turn the heat to medium, medium low and cover it and just let it cook until the potatoes are all the way cooked through. 
So now we're going to look at the second stage of the potato recipe, which is the tempering. So tempering is a uh, technique that is used frequently in uh, Indian cookery and in this video cookbook series we're actually going to be doing it twice once for the lentils and once for this recipe. Uh, in uh, the local language tempering is usually called either bagar or tarka. You would come across the word tarka spelled T-A-R-K-A probably quite often in a restaurant menu especially with a tarka dal and when it is brought to you uh, on the table you would see um, some uh, colored oil and spices uh, usually um, on the surface of the of the dish and that is the tarka or the tempering. Uh, the technique of tempering is basically to bloom spices in hot uh, oil or uh, some butter or ghee or any kind of um, hot fat and as soon as the spices make contact with the hot oil they quite literally bloom. Their flavor uh, increases tremendously and uh, they usually are at their optimum when they're treated in that way. Uh, temperings are usually best done in the smallest possible pan you can find uh, in your kitchen. Uh, the, the main idea is that the surface area should be really small so that when you go in with your oil it creates a little bit of depth without uh, spreading all over the pan. By doing so, by creating that depth, the spices then have a little bit of um, oil to swim in rather than uh, having to use a larger pan and move the pan around and ch uh, have the spices chasing the oil. So it's much better to go for a much smaller pan. You get this sort of pan either online or at cooking stores. It's actually a measuring cup with a handle that also, because it's made out of stainless steel, works uh, works very well to uh, for tempering. Uh, Indian grocery stores, if you have one in your areas, uh, such as in Atlanta, Patel Brothers or Cherians, uh, and they both have uh, an aisle dedicated to uh, Indian utensils and you will find tarka pans, which are uh, small pans that look like this, uh, that work very well. Some of them have a rounded bottom so if you have a, a flat top electric uh, or induction cooktop at home, then you would need to find a small stand to be able to put them on. But if they're flat bottom, then you won't have any problem. So the uh, tempering that we use for this recipe is, uh, as I said before, very typical South Indian ingredients, particularly uh, two of them, or three of them actually, including the coconut oil. Uh, so it's coconut oil which has been used on the potatoes themselves, as well as in the tempering. If you want to use coconut oil only in one and then uh, a flavorless oil in the other, you can use the... Um, a flavorless oil such as grapeseed or canola or vegetable in the potatoes and coconut oil for the tempering. Uh, so that's the, that's the hot fat that we're going to use. Uh, and then we put in these which are black mustard seeds. Uh, so black mustard seeds are a very, very typical South Indian um, ingredient and you'll find them by the bag uh, either online or um, another online source that you can use is www.ishopindian.com. That's also another um, site that will deliver Indian ingredients to your door. So these are black mustard seeds and these go into the hot oil once it's melted. Uh, the feature of black mustard seeds that you look out for is you've got to make sure that they go into really hot oil. You make sure that they don't go into any sort of cold oil because they will take a lot longer to come up to temperature. Once they do, they start to pop and you'll hear a slight uh, crackling noise from your uh, from the inside of your pan. If you leave them there long enough, they will start to pop and jump out of the pan. So you don't, you definitely don't want to get to that stage. You want to just hear that slight crackling and then you go in with the other ingredients, which in this case are ground ginger. Uh, if you can't get fresh ginger, you can use ground powdered ginger in this recipe, same quantity. And um, uh, cumin seed, which is common in many cuisines. And uh, these these are fresh curry leaves. Uh, curry leaves are also available at Indian stores, usually by the bag. Um, these are from my plant at home. They have a deliciously herbaceous, slightly citrusy uh, fragrance. And uh, even in the bag, when you buy them in the bag at the store, they will be on the sprig like this. So all you have to do basically is just pull them off the sprig and um, 
pop them into your pan at the right time. Uh, curry leaves, a lot of people don't know what to do with them uh, other than recipes such as this and the bags come with a, a tremendous amount of curry leaves in them and you don't know what to do with the rest. So the best way to store them is to freeze them. You would um, rinse them very lightly, pat them completely dry with paper towels and then you can either freeze them on the sprig or on the stem or you can take them off and put them into a paper towel lined airtight Tupperware box, one of those types with the clips on the side and um, put them in your freezer and the main thing that you need to be aware of is when you are using them in a recipe from frozen, you need to make sure that they come out of the freezer right before they go into the pan. So don't take them out prior to cooking in an effort to be more organized which is commendable but what will happen is that they will turn black uh, as soon as they've been left to, out to oxidize for any length of time more than say a couple of minutes. So you want to go to the freezer, grab them, pop them in and put the box straight back as soon as you can. Uh, but don't try and dry them, don't try and use dried curry leaves, they have 10% of the flavor and it's really a, a waste of money. So when you buy the bag, use what you, use what you need to and freeze the rest. So we're going to start with the tempering now. So you just light your gas, your heat underneath your little pan and you go in with the coconut oil or any other flavorless oil if you prefer not to use coconut. You can also use expeller pressed coconut which doesn't have the coconutty flavor. So you just let that melt. So this is a one and a half cup size little pan. Anything one to one and a half cup is perfect. So this is two tablespoons of coconut oil that I've put in here. And as you can see, once it's um, melted, it's giving you a, a kind of few millimeters of depth in the bottom of the pan. So it's enough for the spices to be completely immersed in the oil, which is a key to really effective tempering. So that's all melted. We just want to make sure that it's nice and hot. And then we go in with the mustard seeds first of all. Can you hear the, so the slight crackling has already started. And they start to pop. And then you put in the cumin seeds, the curry leaves, And then before the ginger goes in, you take it off the heat because the ginger tends to splutter because of all the moisture in it. So that's your tempering. And then this whole thing gets poured over the top of the potatoes in the next stage of the recipe. So we're back with our potatoes which have been cooking away. Give them a little bit of a stir. If they can develop some nice golden brown edges, that makes them even more appealing and even tastier. So you do want to give them a stir every now and then so that each, all the sides make contact with the hot pan. And then we've got our tempering here which to remind you again is coconut oil, black mustard seeds, cumin seeds, curry leaves and fresh uh, grated ginger. I'm just going to pour that over the top, get all of that out there. And then you just mix it through so that it's nicely evenly distributed. You want to make sure that the tempering isn't clumping in any particular part of the pan and that it's 
evenly distributed all the way through. If your potatoes still have a ways to go to be cooked, make sure that you're cooking it on low heat after you've put in your tempering because if you have it on high heat, the spices will burn and you'll get a bitterness. So you can keep it on low heat, you can cover it and let it go for a longer time if that's what you want. So that's our tempering mixed in with the potatoes. And we're just going to let that cook a little bit longer so that the spices have time to meld and marry. And then we're going to serve it up. So in this recipe, in this next recipe, we're going to be looking at uh, dal. So dal, spelled D-A-L, is basically an Indian lentil preparation. There are, um, I believe, over 400 different types of dals or lentils in the whole of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, each one is not separate from the other. Many of them are part of the same family and are just uh, uh, processed in different ways and to different levels. So the uh, the dal or the lentil that we're going to be dealing with today is called mung and it's spelled in two different ways sometimes with a double O M double O N G and sometimes with a U M U N G uh, sometimes pronounced mung bean or uh, in India it's called mung. So uh, this is the dal in or the lentil in its dry form and it's very easily available at uh, most mainstream stores these days, but certainly at uh, places like the DeKalb Farmers Market in Atlanta and any of your Indian stores or anywhere online, you would uh, easily be able to find this lentil. Uh, the reason I chose this lentil for, the, um, for this video is because it's one of the quickest cooking. Uh, in this recipe in particular, we're gonna be using a pressure cooker. Uh, in this case, an electric pressure cooker. You can also use a stove top pressure cooker. Uh, because uh, it just speeds the whole process up and it also helps the lentil to really cook down into a fine, soft, um, almost pureed consistency, which is how um, uh, this particular Indian dal is served. Uh, unlike uh, the way lentils are prepared in the West where they are kept um, more whole and a little bit more um, al dente. Uh, Indian lentils by and large are treated uh, more as uh, almost soup-like consistency unless they are the, the whole lentil, in which case they're part pureed and part uh, left whole. So uh, yellow mung, this is what it looks like uh, in its raw state. It's important for this recipe, particularly if you're going to be doing it on the stovetop, to soak the lentils beforehand. So that's what's been done here. And these have been soaking, ideally you want to soak it for about an hour. You can soak it for longer. Um, and you want to make sure that it's in a bowl that uh, takes the whole amount of lentils as, and leaves at least half the bowl empty. The reason for that is because they swell and grow in size. So you don't want to use uh, too small a bowl. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to strain out this uh, soaking water and bring it back to show you what it looks like after it's been soaked. So this is what the lentil looks like once it's been soaked for um, about an hour. As you can see, compared to the size of the original lentil, it's uh, doubled in volume and the whole, the whole amount uh, fluffs up and becomes uh, a good bit softer. When you're using a pressure cooker such as this one or even a stovetop pressure cooker, it's not absolutely essential to soak the lentils, uh, but it does help uh, in terms of the digestibility of the lentil as well. Uh, it does make it more easily digestible if you soak it and you uh, drain off the soaking water once during the uh, hour-long process. So at the 30 minute mark you drain it off, refresh the water and then continue soaking it for another half hour. And that, and that applies to uh, any, any lentil or bean. The, the, um, the more whole the bean, the less processed it is, the more phytic acid it's going to produce. So the more 
rumbly tumbly you'll get. Um, so you want to make sure that uh, with, with more whole unprocessed lentils, you can even refresh the water every 15 minutes. Um, and that will also help uh, with the digestion. So uh, what we do is we're going to put it into the pot of the pressure cooker along with a couple of other ingredients. So if you were using a stove prop pressure cooker, you would do the same thing. Just put it into the pan along with these ingredients. The only thing that would differ is that if you are using the uh, old style pressure cooker, which has a weight on top, then you would want to cook it for three whistles. Uh, since we're using an electric, which goes on the basis of time, we're going to be cooking it for about 20 minutes after it comes up to pressure. Uh, on the stove top, this would take 45 minutes to an hour. So as you can see, the, the pressure cooker certainly helps to speed things up. So we're going to add to that some ground turmeric, which gives this dal a lovely golden color. Some salt. This is two teaspoons. A little bit, sorry, one teaspoon. This is a little bit of sugar, which helps to just balance the flavors. Uh, this is two teaspoons of lemon juice and either one large or two small dried bay leaves. So that's gone into the pressure cooker pan. We're going to give that a little mix so that the turmeric gets nicely spread through. And then we add two and a half cups of regular tap water to that. So this is one cup of lentils that has been soaked so it looks like a lot more than a cup because it's been uh, because it's been soaked, but in its dry form, it was one cup, and two and a half times the water to the amount of lentils you've used is usually a good ratio for this preparation. So you mix it together. So it looks like that, and then lid on. Make sure that the vent is closed and you set it for 20 minutes. So this, the, the beauty of the electric pressure cooker is it brings it up to pressure, cooks it and keeps it warm without any intervention from you. So that's a, it's a good gadget to have for Indian lentils. So we're going to heat up our little tarka pan. So the fat that we're using is ghee. Put that into the pan. Ghee is clarified butter, which is butter with the milk solids removed from it. So it's essentially vegan. Vegan form of butter. Has a wonderfully rich flavor and is used a great amount in Ayurvedic cooking, which is the Indian health food. So we melt that down and once again the, the small size of the pan allows just this couple of tablespoons of ghee to create a nice depth so that the ingredients that you're going in with next will have will be completely immersed which will get you a really good tempering. So just to go through what uh, else we're going to be putting in here, we've got uh, some cumin seed. We've got some crushed garlic, four cloves of crushed garlic that's just been crushed in a, in a hand press. Uh, we've got two teaspoons of tomato paste. We've got um, half to one teaspoon of red chili powder, again optional depending on whether you want heat or not, but uh, quite honestly this small amount will just help to give a little bit of color and won't really add too much spice to this quantity of dal, which is one cup. Uh, and here we've got some pre-fried onions, which you get at the Indian stores and the supermarkets as well, and some cilantro sprigs to sprinkle over the top. This is just for garnish. So we've got our melted ghee. And generally with temperings, you always go in with your whole spices first. So in this case, cumin is your whole spice. And that goes in. Let that sizzle a tiny bit. And then you put in your garlic, your tomato paste, 
and your chili powder. Keep the heat low. So you don't want the garlic to burn. If you do feel that anything is burning, just take it off the heat. Mix, mix, mix. Make sure that the tomato paste breaks down. Mix as well with the garlic. Smoosh everything with the back of your spoon. So you can see how beautiful that looks. It smells wonderful too. Make sure it's all well mixed together. And then we're going to put about three-fourths of this into the dal and reserve just a little bit to sprinkle over the top when we serve. So that just needs about a minute cooking away in there. So like I said, about 75% of it in here and a little bit reserved for garnish. So you can see that mixing through there adds beautiful color streaks of spice into the dal. Just pull out any bay leaves. So you don't want to mix it in too thoroughly. You do like to have a few streaks showing in there. And then we go into our serving bowl. And we garnish with the remainder of our tarka. Some of our fried onions. And the sprigs of cilantro. And that's your tarka dal. So for this next recipe, we're going to do a dry fry uh, or dry sauteed style okra dish. Uh, okra is used a huge amount in uh, India. Uh, the tropical weather is perfect for growing it and it's a staple in a lot of Indian uh, homes. So the, uh, the way to, to choose a really good okra is to make sure that it's not too large. The smaller, thinner and slimmer they are, the, uh, the better the okra is likely to be. You're looking for a smooth skin without too much um, uh, fur on it uh, and also you want to make sure that the seeds inside are not too large and the ribs are not too hard which is what is going to uh, leave you with a tough chewy uh, vegetable. So one of the ways in which uh, you tell whether an okra is uh, a good one is by breaking the tip. Uh, if it breaks off cleanly in your hand like that, you've got a, a good specimen. A lot of stores these days, as particularly the Indian stores, have signs saying do not break the tips of the okra. Um, so uh, another way that you can tell is by rolling it between your fingers and making sure that you don't you can't feel or uh, sometimes if the okra is very fibrous you can even hear the crackling of the ribs inside so you want to make sure that that is not part of your okra choosing experience. Um, so uh, what we do for the okra here, uh, a lot of Indian recipes will use the okra very finely sliced into rounds which it can take an awfully long time uh, to prepare. Uh, this luckily is a little less labor intensive and what we do is we first of all wash, uh, thoroughly wash and then uh, dry the okra. It's very important that you dry it really well in a um, uh, dry a tea towel, something something like this, uh, and you can also use paper towels on top to blot off the extra excess water. Uh, too much moisture on the skin of the okra in the pan will create steam, which creates more of the slime. Um, so you want to try and uh, make sure that they're as dry as possible after washing. Uh, then you take each individual uh, okra and you cut off the head as close to the top as possible. You discard that part 
uh, you hold the okra between your thumb and index finger and you just slice straight down the middle so that you get two uh, lengthwise halves. Uh, this is a pound of okra that's been sliced in that way that we're going to use. Uh, if you have a particularly bendy uh, specimen, then you just cut it in half and uh, cut each of the halves lengthwise if you can't get the knife to go all the way down. So that's, that's how we prepare the, prepare the okra. Uh, then the way in which it is, so this is partly um, sautéed and partly roasted. So you do the sautéing on the, on the gas and then after it's, uh, the spices have mixed in and it's uh, developed a little bit of uh, caramelization, you then put it into a preheated oven for 15 or 20 minutes. So it's partly roasted, partly sautéed. Uh, so the oil that we're using for this recipe is grapeseed, but you can use any neutral flavored oil like canola or vegetable. So get your pan up to medium heat and put in two to three tablespoons of oil. So some of the other ingredients that we're using for this recipe uh, that I wanted to go through. One of them is fairly unusual, or two of them are fairly unusual. Uh, one of them is this, which is called asafoetida. Asafoetida comes in jars such as this uh, at uh, local Indian stores, and you can also get it online. Uh, so it's spelled A-S-A-F-E-T-D-I-A. T-I-D-A, sorry, asafoetida, and it, in uh, the Indian language it's called hing, H-I-N-G, which is a lot simpler and easier to remember. So um, hing is a really interesting spice. It um, uh, doesn't have the most pleasant aroma when it's in its raw form, but when it goes into hot oil, some amazing alchemy occurs and it uh, resembles the flavor profile of onions and garlic. Uh, so this, is, this spice is particularly used a great deal by the Jain community, J-A-I-N, uh, in India. And they are a religious community that um, uh, discourages or even bans the uh, consumption of any root vegetables. So no onions, no garlic, carrots, potatoes, nothing like that. So um, there, uh, the belief is that the, when the ground is the ground is desecrated when the earth is disturbed by pulling the, the vegetable out. Uh, so they use a, a tremendous amount of this spice uh, and uh, things like mustard seeds and things like that which uh, gives them the, the flavors in their food. Uh, so this uh, recipe uses just a little bit of hing. You do use it in very, very small quantities. So a jar like this can easily last you a decade or longer. Uh, some people do say that the, the smell is especially strong for them, especially if it's something that you're not accustomed to. So it's advisable to keep it in a Ziploc bag in your pantry. Uh, the other unusual ingredient that we're going to be using is this seed, which is called ajwain, spelt like that, A-J-W-A-I-N. Um, the English name, I believe, is Karam, C-A-R-O-M, but it is very rarely labeled as such in, um, in the stores or even online. So when you go to buy it, this is the name that you would be looking for. Uh, Ajwain is a uh, distant cousin of oregano, and it is used in um, a lot of fried uh, Indian preparations, whether it's sauteed or particularly deep fried, you'll see it in a lot of deep fried preparations. Uh, not only because of the taste, but also because it has um, tremendously beneficial digestive um, properties and it helps uh, he dish heavier, richer dishes to go down more easily. So when we begin this dish, we're going to be using, we're going to be starting with our whole spices, which is the cumin seed and the ajwain, along with the hing. So hing needs to go into hot oil in order to bloom and produce those oniony, garlicky properties that I spoke of earlier. So we keep the heat on medium. We sprinkle in the hing. It will sizzle a little bit. You don't want to let it be in there for too long. Follow it with the cumin seed and the ajwain seed. Give that a bit of a stir. Sizzle away and then follow with all of your sliced okra. As 
so you need a nice big pan that will be able to accommodate all the vegetable. Give it a stir. Sprinkle over some salt. And then we're going to go in with the other ingredients, which are uh, ground turmeric, which gives the color as well as the uh, health properties. Some red chili powder for heat, which is entirely optional. You can leave that out. We've got just a little bit of freshly grated ginger. If you don't have freshly grated, you can use ground ginger powder. We've got some ground coriander. And we've got a little bit of sugar just to balance everything out. So in no particular order, all of those spices go in. Just make sure that they are nicely sprinkled over so that you don't get any concentration of spices in any one particular area because it tends to stick to the, to the okra. I love how it goes brighter green as it cooks initially. Red chili powder, ginger, the okra will shrink a little as it cooks. At this stage you want to keep it over medium high to high heat because you're looking for the okra to get some color and you want the spices to cook in the oil that is coating the vegetable. Ground coriander and sugar. So initially you stir a fair amount to get the spices to melt nicely. And then once that's done, you leave it be for a couple of minutes at a time so that the okra has a chance to really make contact with the pan and get a little bit of caramelization going on it. So don't stir it too much after the initial period. And then you have your oven preheated to 375 and you pop it in there for 15 to 20 minutes before you garnish and serve. So now we're going to cook uh, what is known as a jira pulao or a cumin and vegetable uh, rice dish. Uh, pulao is uh, a rice dish that where the rice is sautéed before being cooked and it's a traditional North Indian rice preparation that has come from uh, as a result of the Central Asian and Persian invaders in India that brought their rice uh, preparations with them and influenced the uh, Indian way of preparing rice. So um, what we're using for this is basmati rice. Uh, so basmati is the uh, long-grained, uh, rather more expensive rice um, that is always used for these sorts of pulao preparations. Uh, never, it's never used for uh, dishes where the rice has to be ground or uh, turned into a batter or anything like that. Always when the rice is served whole you use this high quality rice. Uh, basmati is aged like wine and um, it's always advisable to when you purchase it to buy a sack where there's a window pane and you can see the grains inside and you can make sure that they're not broken and that the quality is uh, nice fine long grain separated rice. Um, 
One of the things that is very important with uh, preparing this or any sort of rice dish is to wash your rice. You must wash it really uh, thoroughly until the water starts to run almost completely clear. So using a mesh colander such as this is a really good way to do it. So the first thing you would do is put your two cups of rice in here and under running water use your hands to massage the rice and keep looking down and having a look and seeing what the color of the water is looking like. If it's still looking very chalky and white then you want to keep uh, rinsing. Once it comes through a little bit more clear then if you have a bowl that is large enough for this for, a, for your colander whatever colander you're using to sit inside the bowl then that is the best way to soak your rice. You sit the, bowl, the colander into the bowl and fill the bowl up with water. The reason for that is because then you can simply when it's time to use the rice you can simply just lift out the colander drain out the water and it goes straight into the pan. The other option is to just put the rice into a mixing bowl and cover it with a couple of inches of water and let it soak. Now different recipes will advise different soaking times. If you're doing a biryani which is a more complex Indian rice dish they will even tell you to soak the rice overnight. The reason for soaking is because the rice actually absorbs some of the water and the grains elongate and when you uh, fry it in the hot ghee or oil um, they puff up and they stay more separate when you cook it so that you don't you get a less mushy result. The uh, hallmark of a really well cooked Indian rice dish is that all the rice grains remain separate. Uh, this is a, a a traditional cooking method that comes from Persia. Uh, today we're using the absorption method which means that we're using the double the amount of water to the amount of rice. So today we have two cups of rice in the recipe so we're going with four cups of water. This is the proportion that I find works for me. Um, you will come across recipes that uh, will give you one and a half times or one and three quarter times the amount of water. But I find that the rice stays slightly al dente. If you prefer that texture then you can use less water uh, otherwise go with the double proportion that's uh, advised in this recipe. So I'm just gonna strain out the soaking water and come back. Okay we're back after having uh, strained the water out of the soaked rice. So this rice has soaked about for about four hours and uh, if you see this is the, the dry rice prior to soaking. If you look at the, the length of the grains and also the color and this is the rice after it is soaked and you can see that the grains are not only whiter but they've also uh, elongated and grown uh, in size because they've swelled up with some of the water. You do uh, want to try and let as much of the soaking water drain out as possible before it goes into your pan uh, because using rice that is too wet in the pan will not result in as fluffy uh, result, uh, an end result as you would like. So uh, the ingredients that we're using for this palau is um, a variety. The oils that we're going to use are a mixture of ghee which is clarified butter and grapeseed oil, a little of each. Uh, after those have heated up in our pan we will go in with some whole spices. The whole spices are cardamom, green cardamom. So this is green cardamom which comes in this uh, dried light green pod and we're only using one for this recipe. You can use two or three if you really like the flavor. Uh, it does lend a beautiful almost perfumed flavor to the rice uh, and for the purposes of this recipe we're going to just snip off the tip so that some of the um, flavor and aroma can escape a little bit more easily without letting out the seeds. The seeds live in the inside of the cardamom pod which depending on how fresh it is you can break sometimes with your nail or just with the knife. When you open up the husk you have a nest of little brownish black seeds inside. There's usually about 10 to 11 seeds per pod and um, when you buy pre-ground cardamom powder in the uh, stores that is just the seeds that have been ground up. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the, um, with the flavor of cardamom as soon as one mentions chai uh, most people can pinpoint the flavor that I'm talking about. Cardamom is the essential flavor in chai masala or Indian tea masala. So um, 
in rice preparations you always use the pod whole and in um, other dishes you would use it uh, the, the seeds ground down. You can either buy the seeds ground or you can open each pod and grind the seeds yourself. Uh, Karam has a, a flavor profile that is citrus uh, and also floral uh, and it also has a, a menthol in it so when you eat one of the seeds you'll find after a few seconds that the part of your mouth where you've chewed the seeds becomes cool. Uh, so it's used uh, also as a breath freshener in India. Uh, people will chew on the seeds after a meal as a, as a breath freshener. So we're going to use cardamom, we're going to use whole cumin seed, we're going to use um, cassia, which is this, which is the uh, Silanese or from, it's from uh, South India, the cinnamon stick that we used in, that we use in India. It's more like a bark and it is a um, cousin of cinnamon. cinnamon. It is easier to use, uh, it has a slightly smokier uh, aroma than traditional cinnamon quills and it's also easier to use because it's very easy to snap and break as opposed to cinnamon quills which are much harder to to work with. So you'll find uh, f in, in Indian stores they're often just labeled as flat cinnamon sticks. Uh, so we use that and we also have some salt and some turmeric powder. The turmeric powder will color the grains of rice yellow. You don't have to use turmeric, you can just leave it white as well. Um, and then we've got a couple of small bay leaves. And then the vegetables that we're adding into the rice today are green peas and diced carrots, but you can uh, also add green beans if you like, um, and even finely chopped zucchini if you have that in your fridge. So we're going to start by heating up our pan we're using a nice deep sided pan here which will take the two cups of rice and the four cups of water comfortably and leave enough space for it to uh, grow in size. So we're going to put in our ghee tablespoon of oil. As you can see very precise measuring is not entirely required for most of these dishes. It's not, it's not an exact science as would be baking or anything like that. The measurements are there as a guide. Certainly in terms of the whole spices you can always afford to put a little bit more the powdered spices, you do have to be a little bit more accurate, especially uh, spices like chili powder and things where uh, heat is concerned. And turmeric also, you do want to be a little careful because too much can lead to a metallic taste. So you want to go in with your cumin seeds, your cinnamon stick, your bay leaves, your cardamom pod that's been snipped. And these are Ajvain seeds, which were also used in the okra preparation, the um, cousin of oregano. And this adds a lovely herbal note to the rice. And then from there, we, we let our, our spices sizzle for just a few seconds. And then we add all our rice. And we stir briskly along with the salt. The idea is that you're trying to get the rice to be coated with the ghee and oil mixture because by coating the rice then when you add the water because water and oil don't mix you get a fluffier result. And then we put in our turmeric. I'm just going to add a tiny bit. Again, you don't have to add this if you want to keep it white. So you want to mix it in the oil for a couple of minutes or a minute. 
Don't worry if it sticks a tiny bit on the bottom because when the water goes in, that will all come off. We're going to add in our peas and our carrots. This is a especially pretty rice dish with the contrasting colors. And then you're going to add in your four cups of water. And make sure that it that you draw all the rice down from the sides of the pan. That's really important because you don't want it to stick and burn. And you also want to drag your spoon across the bottom of the pan to make sure that anything that's stuck down there gets mixed with the water and that the cooking is even. Okay, then you're going to bring this mixture up to a brisk boil uh, to the level where you're seeing bubbles in the sort of towards the center of the of the pan and then you cover it, turn it down to a low, uh, medium low simmer and uh, simmer it for 10 minutes. We're back after the uh, rice has had a few minutes to come up to the boil. So you're looking for a brisk boil and lots of bubbles all around the edges coming in towards the center. And then you want to turn it down to medium low to low. So it's still steaming, but the bubbles subside a little bit. And then you cover it and give it exactly 10 minutes on the timer. And once that 10 minutes is up, you want to turn off the heat, turn off the timer, and just leave it be for five minutes, completely undisturbed. Um, so you could set a 15 minute timer, and then when it gets to 10 minutes, uh, gets to five minutes, just turn it off, or do two separate timers. But the, the initial 10 minutes is very important to make sure that you keep to that time so that it, the rice doesn't overcook. Okay, so we're back after the rice has had 10 minutes to cook, as well as five minutes to steam. So 15 minutes in total. The gas went off after the 10 minutes and then it was just left alone for five minutes. So we're gonna take the lid off. And you can see we'll just pick off you want to definitely pick off any of the whole spices that have risen to the top, like the cinnamon and the uh, bay leaf. The cardamom is often harder to find, but today it's presented itself right at the top. Uh, I think there's one more piece of cinnamon floating around in there somewhere. So that's what that looks like. And uh, you should be able to fluff it very easily with a spoon. And as you can see, each grain is separate and it's not a... Uh, it's not mushy. So we can serve that onto a serving bowl. Found the second cinnamon stick. It's just a very light golden because I just used a little bit of the um, turmeric. And you can see the lovely contrasting colors of the carrot and peas. You can garnish this rice with um, fried onions or fried shallots which can taste delicious and that is your complete meal. Uh, so the five dishes that we covered are the sauteed South Indian potatoes, the spiced okra, the fried fish or tarili machi, the tarka dal and the cumin pulao. All of these five dishes can be eaten, can be served together as one meal if you're entertaining. Or typically in India, you would eat rice, dal and vegetable, either of the two vegetables together with the fish. So uh, I hope you prepare these dishes at home and enjoy them. And if you have any questions for me, please do feel free to comment or contact me at uh, my email address. Again, that's Kesar Kitchen, K-E-S-A-R Kitchen, all one word, at gmail.com or post on my Facebook page. Thank you. Mm -hmm.